Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about how to create engaging nutrition videos. My name is Sarah Haas, and this is sponsored by the American Egg Board's Egg Nutrition Center. So let's jump in right away a little bit about me. Like I said, my name is Sarah Haas. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. I am also a trained chef and recipe developer, which basically means I like to cook and eat a lot, which is pretty much the truth. I am also a professional food photographer. Again, I am really into food and I'm also an author. So I think it's important to know though, that uh, most of all, I have probably been in your shoes no matter what part of nutrition you are in. Like I have done the clinical stuff, I've done the community stuff, I have done the food service stuff, I've done it all. So I know that you do a lot and I know that asking you to do video is asking you to do even more. So I hope though, by the time this is over that you'll see that maybe it's not as hard as you think it is to get started in video or if you're stuck, how to get over that hump. So enough about me, well, one second. Uh, these are my disclosures. So again, we are very excited that this webinar is sponsored by the American Egg Board's Egg Nutrition Center. And these are just some of my clients that I work with as well as some of the products and services I supply or provide. Okay, so today it's all about video creation. Now I'm sure that all of you have watched a video, seen a video, maybe some of you made some videos, but maybe you're just a little confused or lost or have some questions. And hopefully some of the content that I'm presenting today will inspire you, get you motivated to try it again, uh, or at least tackle some of the obstacles you felt like you were experiencing. So a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Basically, I'm going to introduce you to why I think this is so important for you to know, why I think video is an important tool to have in your tool belt and what that looks like in social media, especially right now. Also, we're going to go through the process. I'm going to talk to you about how I go through uh, coming up with the ideas for the videos, how I do them from start to finish. I'm going to talk to you about cameras, lighting, and some of the gear. I'm also going to talk about what the production looks like. I'm going to take you through a real life example. It's exciting stuff. I'm also going to touch on, no, I'm not going to touch on, I'm definitely going to talk about filming and touch on the editing portion, which could be a whole separate topic. So there you go. All right. So why do I think it's so important that you should know video? I think it's important because right now video is everywhere. Think about social media. And when you go there, I'm guessing you have been there recently. I'm guessing you have a TikTok account, an Instagram account, some sort of social media platform where you go there. And let me ask you to think about this. Every time you go there, how often are you captured by the video content that lives there? You know, you're scrolling and you see a video and then you're watching and watching and you're like, oh my gosh, that's great. I love that. And hit the, you know, the like button or whatever. Now think about the time you spend watching the video and then think about the time you spend looking at captions and the time you spend looking at pictures. Would you say you spend more time looking at the video or would you say you spend more time reading the captions and looking at pictures? Now I love pictures. So I probably one of the rare people that takes maybe the few extra seconds to really look at a picture, feel engaged and really respond to it. Whereas I think there are quite a few people who, who wouldn't spend that time. So even, even me, who I spent a lot of time looking at the picture, at some point I scroll away. But with video content, most of it's at least 30 seconds, 60 seconds in the short form version. So there, people are staying, they're engaged. That's why video is so amazing. It keeps whoever's watching there, they're watching, they're in it. They wanna see what's going on. That's why it's so important. So when you have that video, it's gonna improve engagement, how people respond to you. It also gives you this presence that you didn't have before you know maybe you go to work every day and you put your lab coat on and you do all the things uh but then you get home and it's like ah i need a, i need a presence so that people can hear my voice outside of this clinical perspective or whatever so giving you kind of even a different persona in a will in a way uh again it's just a great way to connect with people and provide a really personal touch too so people get to see who you are and ultimately we kind of just want to know who people are Video is just kind of like an, a way to get people to know us a little bit better, to trust us, to connect and, and form this bond and this community kind of thing. And finally, like video, people love it. Remember that question I asked you earlier? People want video. They just want to see your face. They want to know what's going on. They want to be entertained. They want to have information. They don't want to read about it. They want to watch it. So think about that when you decide whether or not you want to create video. How do you feel about it? 
guessing you like it, right? Yeah. So I think what this means for you is maybe a few things, but for me, what it means mostly is we can't live in a space where we think that we can't, we shouldn't have to move forward with everybody else. I guess a better way of looking at that is I remember when I was in school, right? Like a hundred years ago, no one said to me, Sarah, you're going to have to learn how to create video. And by that, I mean, you're going to have to learn how to use a camera, record it, know about frame rates. You're going to have to know about lighting and camera settings. You're going to have to know how to edit a video. You're going to have to know, upload it. You're going to have to know all the stuff. Now, if someone would have said that to me, I would have been like, what are you talking about? My major is nutrition. I am just doing nutrition stuff. So mm -mm, I'm not doing video. If I wanted to do that, I would have signed up for the video course or that's not even what it's called, but you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I could live in that. I could say, you know what? I never learned. I never got to, no one ever instructed me how to do that. I could stay in that space where I'm like, no, I'm determined to make my difference without learning the new things. But here's a shocker. Most people, you're going to get left behind because bloggers, bloggers, people who don't know anything, they're all over this stuff. So you could either let them take the reins or you could keep up with them. And by keeping up with them, I don't mean you have to produce the amazing quality of content that they're producing. I mean, in terms of production, you know, we, I don't have like four people standing around to film me and make sure my makeup looks good. I don't think that that's important, but what I'm saying is if you want to be relevant, if you want your voice heard, you have to keep up. And unfortunately you don't always learn those things in school. That's why we're always about learning more. So to me, it just makes sense. Adding video to your repertoire is going to help boost your credibility and it's going to help people see you. You're going to have your voice out there and it's going to make a difference. You're hopefully helping people, which is why we went into this career as a first, you know, for the first place in the first place. So you as a registered dietitian, you're credible. You have great information to give. You went to school for like a long time. You know, you've been doing stuff for a while. You've got great tips to share. And I think this is such a great platform to differentiate yourself from the people that don't have that same background. You know, let yourself shine, be your own star. Don't wait for other people to interview you and make you feel great. Like tell everybody why you're great and what you know. Uh, so I think it's great for that. I also think it's great for lifting up voices of other people. So you might know people that in your profession that are doing a great job. You can help elevate their voice with video the same way that you elevate yours. And then it's also just a way to create community and have a trusted resource for people who are looking for that, or even just as a resource for people who, you know, they need this kind of content. So I think it's a fantastic platform. And even if it's intimidating, I think it's, it's worthwhile to at least dabble in it. All right. Okay. So you might be like, great, Sarah, I'm so motivated. I cannot wait to get started on this video. You're like busting out your phone. You're ready to go. But then you're like, ah, what do I do? What do I put out there? I don't even know what I'm supposed to, what kind of content am I supposed to produce? I'm not going to leave you hanging. Of course I have some ideas, but I think ultimately content can be anything. And I would encourage you actually to look at your everyday experiences and use them as a way to build up the content for whatever, you know, for, for building your video profile. A great starting point is answering some of those frequently asked questions that you get on an everyday basis. Say you work in a dialysis clinic and almost weekly, you have someone asking you like, oh, I'm never sure what I should eat before I come in for dialysis or what I should eat after, or, you know, whatever those questions are, take them and then make a quick video, you know, 30, 60 seconds answering that exact question. Now you don't need to say like Joe Smith asked you that, in fact, don't, but just use his question as, a, as content for your channel, whatever outlet it is. And then the beautiful thing about that is if you create a bunch of those types of things, you can just tell your patients, clients, head on over to my, you know, Instagram, my YouTube channel. I've got a whole section all about that particular topic. And then, wow, you have become such an amazing resource to them. And then you don't have to give them that handout that they'll just toss in the glove compartment or like in the recycling bin when they get home. You know, don't, don't waste a tree for that. Instead, you know, give them that engaging, entertaining connection through video. And they'll come back and they'll think you're amazing and because you are. So there's one idea. Another one is correcting misinformation. So I know so many dietitians do this already and I love it. I love it so much that we're able to clarify things so that people aren't feeling confused. So 
there are plenty of ways to do this, right? You don't necessarily have to name or finger point anyone, but you can say like, I've heard recently about this particular problem. And let me tell you why I don't think that's true. I'm a registered dietitian, blah, 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 blah. So use all that misinformation that has you shaking your head and, and bashing your head against a wall. Use that as content. Because how fun is that to correct misinformation? Everybody loves correcting people, right? Another option is explaining recent studies. So dietitians are amazing humans. I am convinced of this because you are capable of reading a study and comprehending the information, interpreting it, and then translating it to other people in a way that makes sense. Not many people can do that. So if that is your jam, if studies make you happy, then you should absolutely take that content to your channel. Because who doesn't want to know a little bit more, feel a little bit smarter about something, and then you can be the one to do that for them. I think that's beautiful, do it. Uh, another great option are the headlines. You can literally go every single day to the same resource and find a headline that makes you crazy or makes you excited uh, and use that as inspiration for your content. You know, maybe it's a new product or a new cooking method, or it's like a new recipe you saw, whatever. There are so many headlines that could be awesome content for your video. Another option is doing some kind of tutorial. So, you know me, I love food and I love cooking. And I love showing people how to cook and make it fun. So, Naturally, I lean towards recipe kind of work or teaching people how to cut something or make a sauce or whatever. So for me, that's pretty simple. I mean, for you, maybe you like to, uh, maybe you teach uh, blossoming dietitians. So maybe you want to do a tutorial on the best way to write a soap note. That can be a video, you know, that can even be a series of videos. So I think that there's so much potential with you know clinical stuff too, community stuff. So it's not just you have to make a bunch of recipes because you absolutely don't. If that's not your wheelhouse and you don't like to do it, well, don't do that because anything that inspires you, which is my last point, but for some reason I'm telling you now, but do anything that inspires you because if you are delivering content and then you don't like it or enjoy it, well, then no one wants to listen to you. You probably don't even want to listen to you. So why would anybody else? Make sure the content you're delivering is something you want to present. Ultimately, this channel, this outlet is yours, unless it's for work, but even then you can cultivate it so that it's your voice and feels like you. Uh, the last one I have here is collaborating for interviews. So maybe you're like, I don't wanna be on camera, Sarah. I don't want to be talking the full 30 or 60 seconds. I understand. I can literally talk to a wall, so that's not a problem for me, but I know that some people that's intimidating or scary. I will say that over time that gets easier. So the more you do it, the easier it gets. But maybe in the beginning, you want to interview someone. I think that's great. Find a colleague who does something inspiring or go out into the community and find someone who does something that is in your you know, wheelhouse of interest and interview them for it. I think that is such an excellent way to bring exposure and lift other people's voices while also lifting yours and then kind of making your community bigger and more interesting. All right. Whew, I'm ready to take a deep breath. All right, we're in it. We're in it to win it. So now, now that you're all inspired and you know what content you're going to make, let's kind of dive into all the things that go into this, because it can be as simple as jumping in, turning on your camera and just going. There's something beautiful about spontaneity that you can absolutely do. And in fact, I think it's important with all your produced things that you're going to be doing now that you also do some of those spontaneous things, because that's kind of the real you. You're feeling it, you're in the moment. So even though I'm gonna talk about the camera, the equipment, the lights, the whatever, the scripts and all that, uh, don't, don't have a fear of just coming on camera and being you and doing the things that motivate you, inspire you or whatever, okay? All right, don't you, you gotta have a little fun with this because it is, it's not, you know, you're not dissecting humans here. This is, this is, this is fun stuff ultimately. All right, so now you're ready to go and you're like, great, Sarah, what camera do I need? And I'm like, no, don't do that to yourself. The camera you need is the one you already have. Don't go out and spend a bunch of money up front because you're like, well, I'm taking video. Now I'm going to need uh, all this gear. Sarah told me I'm going to need a light. Sarah told me I'm going to need this. You don't. Sarah never told you that. Sarah told you, you just need the, probably your smartphone and it's camera that's inside of it. That's what I told you. Borrow someone else's. Don't even buy a new one. Don't do it because you can create excellent video with your iPhone. And I'm going to show you because that's my example that we'll go through in a little bit, but don't invest in that expensive gear right away. I tell people to start with what you've got. 
at some point, if you're creating a lot of video and you're noticing there's a roadblock, well, that's when you explore the option of investing in something more. But if you're ready to go and if you have the camera and you don't feel any limitations, why, why would you buy something new unless you think that's fun and you have an extra budget somehow? All right. So that's that's my view on that. OK, so of which I guess I kind of talked about. I, I, I like to jump ahead of myself, but it's fine. Right. You guys are with me. All right. So the first thing you should do is find the spot where you think you're going to want to be shooting these videos now the spot that you choose that you want to use may not be the best spot so i have had people tell me that they've had to go to their closets the laundry room the basement you know their bathroom because it has the best sound it has the best light and that's just where they end up so if you want to shoot somewhere and it just doesn't work it's okay you'll just have to learn to be a little bit more flexible or you just need to figure out the timing differently for example like I love to shoot in my kitchen, but I have this strong light that comes in during the afternoon. And sometimes that produces light that I don't really like. So I have to think about, do I change my location? Do I change the time that I'm shooting? You know, what's more important to me? So I would encourage you to find a couple of spots that work for you on different times of the day, because uh, obviously the sun looks different during the day and it provides different colors of light and all that stuff. But you won't know that until you move around and try it out. So another thing you want to do when it comes to your spot is find a place where you're not going to have a bunch of distractions. So maybe next to the kid's playroom isn't a good idea. Uh, maybe it's a great idea to put your dog inside so he doesn't bark at the squirrel while you're trying to shoot the video. You know, all these things. Think of all the things that would distract you from shooting your video and try to find a spot that isn't anywhere near those things. Part of your choosing, part of choosing your spot is also choosing the light. So I would encourage you at this point, if you're just starting to go with natural light. So the sun, the sun, all right? Use the light that's free because it's free and it's fabulous. And it actually makes the most beautiful light on almost anything. So if you can, I, and you, you surely should just use natural light, skip the artificial, uh, but that might affect your spot, right? So I was mentioning before how in my kitchen, the afternoon sun is really harsh. It usually comes in, if it's a clear day, that sun comes in so hard, I get really hard shadows and then part of my face is blown out and it doesn't look very good. So I don't ever shoot in my kitchen dur during the midday. So I just make a note to myself, Sarah, if I wanna film a, a cooking video, I'm either gonna have to do it in the morning or I'm gonna shoot later with artificial light or I'm gonna find a different space. So you may have to do that. Your space might not always be the same and you may need to just keep notice of what your lighting looks like. All right, so I sort of touched on cameras already. I will say, if you do have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera and you know how to use it, well, sure, go ahead. You don't have to use your smartphone. I don't care what camera you use. Use the one that you know how to use that you don't have to learn. And if eventually you want to move on to something else, then use that. Um, you know, if you feel like a DSLR or mirrorless camera will just hinder your process, don't worry about it. Like I said, the smartphone cameras are so good. They're like amazing. So you should just capitalize on the thing you already have. One of the option is to decide between one or two cameras. Now, oftentimes I'll shoot with well, maybe half and half, one and two cameras. Reason being, if you're shooting video for recipes, a lot of times, you know, I like the overhead shot, but I might want to talk to the camera. So in order for me to not have to record twice, I just record the same time with the overhead running and the other camera at my face. You can use your a spouse's phone as your second camera if they'll let you it doesn't have to be the dslr or whatever it can be your ipad or whatever device you have it can be that or you can just not worry about it and record twice we'll talk about scripting and shots and stuff like that so that you can get a better idea i'm just lazy or maybe it's efficient so i prefer to have that two camera set up if i can whenever possible all right other gear because you're like oh well maybe i can get some other gear <laughs> right it's all about the gear uh I will say that the four things I mentioned here are things that I think are pretty good investments if you're really into video. First is a tripod or some kind of stand. And I'll show you my setup in one of the videos, but the tripod is the only way to shoot video, I think, if you're doing any of the talking head videos or if you're doing any recipe work because you want something, you want your, your shot to be still. You don't want a lot of bouncing, uh, it, it just is distracting and makes people feel sick. 
So if you could have your camera mounted on a tripod, amazing. Plus that gives you freedom. You know, you don't have to worry about that camera. You just hit record and it just does its thing and you can start and stop a million times and you're good to go. So you don't have to worry about the focus and all that. Oh, it's so much, it's a breeze. So get a tripod or a stand to hold your camera phone. Another option is a diffuser. So I was talking about that light that comes into my window in the kitchen and then it's pretty hard. So sometimes I need something between the light source and me or the light source and my food so that it doesn't look so scary. Uh, diffusion is the one way to do it. Now, people are like, oh, you gotta buy something for that. No, no, you don't. You can just use your curtains. I have curtains I use. I even have dark panels of curtains that I hang on my windows when the sun's too bright. Uh, you can also use sheets and basically anything that has is a thin fabric you can use. And a tablecloth, I've seen people use those too. Why not? See, there's so many options. I've already given you three. Uh, so sometimes you need that, sometimes you don't. So you just have to play around a little bit. Um, and then bounce cards are things I use a lot in recipe stuff because the hard light, if the light comes in and then it's really dark on one side, I need something to bring light back into my scene. So the bounce card just brings, you know, takes the light from the outside, bounces back onto my food so that it doesn't have such a dark presence. Now, some people like all those hard shadows and that's totally fine too. Like if you're into that hard shadow stuff, that is your opportunity to be creative and artistic. So feel free to play around, see what you like. I just like bounce cards because I feel like sometimes things just get a little too dark. So then I have the option to play. Uh, and a bounce card is really just a piece of thumb board. It's, that's all it is. You know, you can get it at the drugstore down the street. Super simple, love it. Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna walk you through my process of how I film videos. And I wanna lead with saying, my process doesn't have to be your process. It's just sort of how my mind works to wrap my brain around what I'm gonna be doing. And I, I think it's important to hear me say that because you know everybody works differently. I'm not super analytical. I'm more like, woo, creative person. So what works for me might not work for you and that's okay. But I'm just giving you some groundwork for some basics so that you can work with it down the road and, and adjust it according to your personality type. All right, so first up in my example, we're gonna work through an example, like I told you, a real life example, exciting stuff. I like to decide, okay, what type of project am I doing here? You know, if I, I'm like, I wanna make a video, then I'm thinking, okay, well, am I making this, is it more of a work professional video? Like, do I need to be professional Sarah? You know, I'm still showing my amazing personality but I am being professional about it. Or is it more fun? Like I'm making cookies. I want you in my kitchen. I wanna show you my special trick for using my cookie scoop. That's good to know, right? I need to know like what, I, what I, where I'm starting from. So once I figured out work versus fun, then I'm going into the scope of the project. And really it's, I narrowed it down to these kind of things, these three things. So the platform for sharing. Uh, I often lead with this because I'm like, ooh, where is this gonna land? To me, that's really important to know where this video is going. So I'll decide that. And then I'll decide, okay, what kind of content am I using? Am I gonna be doing a recipe? Am I gonna be doing a talking head video? Am I gonna do an interview? Am I going out to the grocery store to show you a grocery store trip? Uh, am I doing a combination of these things? I'm gonna write that here. Content length, again, super important, especially if you're doing like a work project because you need to know your time limit. Less important maybe for fun, but once you get an idea of what your audience likes, you'll get a better understanding of what length of video is really good for them. So short form, long form, medium form, yeah, you get to decide, it's very exciting. So then what happens next is this roadmap I create for myself. I'm like, okay, I've kind of, I'm stirring up the ideas. The ideas are flowing in my head. I got stuff going on, all this scary, but I do. And then I'm like, okay, let's get to work. So then I decide this section one here of content selection and timing. So before it was just brainstorming. And now I'm like, nope, I'm deciding. This is my decision time. So I'm deciding what I want to shoot. Where am I sharing it exactly? How much time do I have for this? So brainstorming is done. Now I'm making decisions. I'm gonna show you in the next slide what I'm talking about, but then I move on taking that information to create what I call a content brief. And it's just basically this information, but it's written down so that I can stay on point and on task. And it's clear to me what I'm doing. Uh, that includes everything from a topic, a title, keywords, audience. I wanna make sure I always get my takeaways in the video. 
uh, because I want people to come away from the video having learned something or knowing something that they didn't know before, or if my goal is entertainment, that at least I feel like I've entertained them, right? So that's what that's all about. All right, so here is my content brief. As part of my content brief, I also always add a run date. Now for you, you might wanna add, um, you know, I wanna have everything filmed by date, a filmed by date or whatever. Add all the deadline dates you need so that you stay on track. You know, maybe this lives in a calendar for you too, so that it's easy for you to stay on your schedule. But for me, I always have that the day I actually really want this to run because social media, it gets crazy, right? So if you're posting to social media or wherever you're posting, you know, it's good to have a calendar so that your content gets up when you want it to come up. Otherwise you'll find a mil million excuses to not put it up that time. All right. So project type, I'm going to go, in my example, we're going with a personal project. This is a personal thing to me. I'm going to include my key messaging, which I'm going to discuss a little bit below. So right now I know my, my, I'm, I'm, I don't have to be professional, Sarah. I can be Sarah, um, but I do kind of want a little more, um, less goofy, more practical, Sarah. So that's kind of what I'm going for. My production type, then this is where I decide, okay, I'm gonna do the short form video because I know that this is gonna live on Instagram. And I chose Instagram because for me, that's my best platform. Um, you know, for you, it might be something else. Maybe you like a different platform, but I have the most followers on Instagram. I like my people on Instagram and I know what kind of content they like. So I'm gonna go with short form video. I'm gonna make it a reel. So now I know that it's gonna be that 16 by nine orientation. And I have learned that 30 seconds is awesome for my audience. They love that, but I almost can never deliver my content in that amount of time. So I'm gonna keep it around 60 seconds or so, because I think that that will keep them engaged and I'll try to do things to keep them engaged and make them stay the whole time, but whatever, 60 seconds. So my topic and the content, I'm deciding to go with a recipe and I'm using the recipe as a way to educate people about an important topic to me, which is heart health education. So I think that, that's what's beautiful about cooking and food is that you can use it as an educational tool, not just for talking about cooking, but for leading into talking about disease states or helping people understand more about how food affects health. So I'm going to be making my veggie loaded egg muffin cups and talking about heart health. Uh, my target audience, I mean, ultimately, I just want anyone who's busy, who has any misunderstandings about how eggs can fit into a heart healthy diet. Uh, those are my people. That's who I'm trying to reach. I find that most people have some confusion. So I'm here to clear, clear the air, make everybody feel a little bit more confident, a little bit more okay with everything. So that goes with my goals. So I'm going to make it fun and easy. I'm going to add little fun things around along the way. I'm going to try to capture angles that excite you and things maybe you haven't seen. Maybe, uh, I'm going to let you know that the recipe I'm making actually has, um, American heart association approval which means it's also heart check certified, which is super cool. So I'm clearing up the confusion, like, look, I'm using eggs and this recipe made with eggs is actually has this heart check certification. So it's kind of like a, a no brainer way to showcase that, which I love clearing up the confusion. Uh, vibe, well, you've seen me, I don't do anything super serious. It's just <laughs> impossible. So I will keep things light and fun. It's gonna be my kitchen. I'm gonna make you feel like you're with me. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep it super engaging. So that's my vibe. Key message. Again, I'm gonna add it here just so in case I'm like, okay, what am I doing? It's how eggs fit into a heart healthy diet. So that's my content brief. Yours might look different. You might wanna structure it differently. Maybe you're a spreadsheet person. Maybe that works better in a spreadsheet. I don't know. You can change it up however you want. I think as long as you get an idea of what you're doing, it surely helps with the next stage of writing a script. Now I will lead into this by saying, I have done it so that I've made a recipe first and filmed the recipe and then written the script and learn from me that that is an awful thing to do because you have to basically make up a script by watching yourself doing something, which is really, really hard. So instead I encourage you to have a script in mind, even if you don't wanna like script out all the words, just have some sort of outline or whatever of your talking points at least. So then, then you can do the next part, which I'll show you in a second. So for my example, I'm creating these egg muffin cups and I'm leading with this heart healthy messaging. So when I write a script for something like this, I usually write my goal at the top. So I want people to have 
more clarity and how eggs fit into a heart healthy diet. That's just sort of living in my head. That's nothing I'm saying. It's just how it's living in my head. And when I write this script, I think this is funny because no one else is with me in this script, right? It's just S. That's me, Sarah. And I laugh every time, even I do it every time. Like someone else is here with me in the script, but I don't know. I think it, it, there's something about it that helps me break it up. So again, you can lay it out however you want. Maybe you don't want to put your initial there to help designate your lines. It's fine. One thing I do like to do is go back and whatever is my key messaging, I like to put KM by it, which is that blue designation or some something. Maybe it's italics or I put it in bold. Then that way, if I get off the cuff, if I start going off the rails, I'm talking about something else. I know that these are the key messages that I need to come back to and make sure I say them. So I don't want to forget these things. You know, maybe your key message is something else, but you want to make sure you hit that message. So for me in a script, it's always like, how do I, I want to make sure I designate that somewhere so that I don't forget to say it. Right. So that's one way I do it. Again, you can find it however you want. So here's my script. Um, I've already obviously made the recipe and looked at it. So I already kind of know how the recipe flows, which is how I can write the script. You know, if you're doing a talking heads video, this is great. Of course you want to script that out a little bit, you know, like you have everything ready to go. So you can just basically talk off the cuff. Okay. And the script is what's going to help you with the shot list. So all this stuff builds on top of each other. It's like, one thing helps you get to the next spot. This one gets you to the next spot so that when it comes time to film, you're like, I got this. I'm good. I got all the things to prepare me. So the shot list, which you'll see in a second, don't worry, I'll share my shot list with you, is where you're taking the time to identify the shot you want for your script parts. So I broke all my uh, talking points into different pieces, segments. And then I like to figure out for each of those segments, what camera angle I'm trying to capture, what I think I'm going to use, how I think the message could get told the best um, for that particular section. So, you know, there's a lot to think about and I'm gonna show you these different uh, shots that I have written here. So we're gonna look at what an overhead shot looks like, a close up, a point of view, a medium shot, all these things will make sense in a second, but you'll notice in a lot of videos now, it used to be, well, let me start with, it used to be that a lot of recipe videos, especially were the hands and pants, the overhead shot, just the hands coming in and doing the things and the camera never moved. It was just there the whole time. And the only thing that moved was the, for the people's hands coming in and out and the food. Well, someone came along <laughs> and was like, Hey, um, we should get a lot of camera angles and we should have a lot of action with those camera angles because that's more engaging. And I agree. But it's also a little intimidating, right? Because now, you know, going back to that story of how you didn't learn video, well, not only do you just have to hit the record button, like now you got to figure out where your camera needs to go and should it be coming in and out and from side to side and ah, it can be really overwhelming, you know? And I would say to you, and I'll probably say it a couple more times, start with whatever angle makes sense for you. When I shot most of my early videos, I shot almost primarily overhead because it's easy. It's, you just bring things in and out, in and out, and it, it's it's fine and it, and it is fine i mean some people will say that's less engaging and maybe but i mean if you're moving things around and you're you know having some action and it's not taking you're not landing there forever then it's going to be fine any content is better than no content so start with one angle that works for you when you start feeling more comfortable then you can work in other angles to make more creating uh video creating more interesting engaging videos so let's go through those angles really quickly so uh, this is the one I told you I default to. So this is just that overhead shot. You know, it's really easy to get. You can get pretty wide with it too. So if you're doing a wide angle shot, you can get a lot of stuff in it. It's easy. I don't have to move the camera. It's all staying there. You just have to make sure everything's in focus. So working on focus is your key for this overhead shot. I like it. Like I said, it's easy. It's approachable. Anyone can do it. Next up is the close up shot. Same, same overhead angle. I'm just in closer. So I like the shot for showing action or if you really want to make a point, right? And if you really want to make a point, you do the extreme close up. So if you really want to get in there and show them the thing, the texture, the whatever, um, the pores of your best friend, then you're, <laughs> that's the shot you want. This one's really fun. So if you want to create a video where people feel like they're doing the thing, do the point of view shot. That's this sort of angled shot that feels like it's coming from your perspective. 
the up angle is where the camera is kind of going up at the thing. It's just, it's kind of dynamic, right? It's like boom in your face and big and, and big energy, which I really like for cooking. Down angle is the opposite of up angle. So you're still at an angle. Uh, you're capturing more stuff. It's not exactly a top down or an overhead shot, just giving you a different perspective. And then the medium shot is what you see most of the time in cooking videos or, you know, when your people are being interviewed on TV, it's that waist up shot. And you'll see it a lot too, you know, with in cooking videos when people travel around to get to their cabinets or whatever too. And there's also a full shot, which I didn't touch on, but a full shot will capture the whole body, which might be fun for like a farmer's market tour or something like that. So as promised, here is my shot list. I just include it right in my script. And I do this because it helps me stay organized. Uh, and again, it could be different for you. Maybe you're a spreadsheet person and you've got to have that off to the side, do whatever works for you. But I like to include it as part of my script. Uh, and then I print the whole thing out and then I can just, when I need to reference it quickly, it's there for me. Um, so you'll see, we can walk through it. So I'm going to lead my video of these delicious egg cups and talking about my heart healthy messaging with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead it out. I'm going to come into my kitchen. I'm going to invite you in. So I'm going to do that waist up shot, talking to the camera, smiling at you, feeling, letting you feel loved. And then I'm going to move into making the muffin cups. And sometimes I like to show the ingredients because I think, I don't know, it's just an extra shot. It's kind of fun. People want to see, oh, what is she using? Uh, and that's usually just a hands and pans overhead shot. I also sometimes include this like VO for voiceover. I mean, obviously it's voiceover, but like, I don't know, sometimes it's helpful for me to think, oh, was I thinking I'd shoot this, like I'd be talking to the camera as I'm doing it, or am I thinking that I am just gonna voice over that? So another thing you can add. So you'll see, I've listed all my shots. The next step is preheating the oven and spraying muffin pan with nonstick cooking spray. So I always think it's fun to get close up on things that are a little more intricate. I mean, not intricate, but like, you know, it's a little more interesting. So you can get in real close to the spray. So that's gonna be a close up shot. And then some scenes we're gonna need like two or three or four shots, which is why you'll see the rest of the steps below. I've got a few shots because uh, you're gonna create a lot of video <laughs> and a lot of different, if you're doing different angles, it's just gonna help break up the video, which you'll see at the end. So like for the finely chopping the onion and spinach, and stirring it in a bowl. I'm gonna do veggies in the bowl, an overhead shot, but I also, once I get, I want, once I get them together in the bowl, I also want a close up of stirring everything together. So again, remember I'm coming in on that action, that close up, just to sort of change up the view and let people know like, this is what we're doing right now. And then a point of view of adding the mixture to the muffin cups, you know, that heads on view, like you're making the muffin cup. So just kind of fun. And again, these, I, I do this, and then sometimes I don't get that shot or sometimes I am in it and I'm like, oh, I'd rather have this shot or I'll get the shot and then I'll take a different shot. So I guess what I'm saying is even though you made the list, it doesn't mean you have to stick to it. No one is following you and saying, oh, Sarah, you didn't do that pan and that zoom out shot that you wrote there. No one cares. So if you're overwhelmed too, and you're like, you get to the bottom of it and you're like, I just want to shoot this overhead and be done. Do it. I think the, the less stress you put on it, the more beautiful it will come out. Stress less, that's my motto. 2024, you're stressing less. Okay, so just when you mastered angles, you're like, I got this. I'm gonna go take a medium shot of that. And then I say, now there's things called camera actions. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, I will say this though. The actions are just complementary to the angles. So. I would say master your angles first. There's not that many. And then work on the actions. And I will also say this, the actions aren't as scary or as intimidating as they sound. So this is just an introduction for you. And then eventually you can move on, find the YouTube video that explains all about it and learn every intricate detail. But for now, this is just a little introduction for you to know more, but the camera actions help with creating those more dynamic videos. Some people are really good at this. They're you know, they're capable of moving their camera around a little bit more, they're a little more comfortable. But again, I would say get comfortable filming the video before you move into these actions. So zoom versus zoom out, probably the easiest one, which is why I put it first. And it's something you can do either during shooting the video or in editing. So zoom in versus zoom out, camera stays in place. And you're either, you know, taking it, your iPhone camera up or down or whatever. So it's just a static position 
and you're zooming in and out. I think the one, there's like one that has a little toggle that will just go in and out and do that. If you have a real camera, you just adjust the lens. The dolly in, dolly out is where um, the dolly in, is it moving in and out this way? Um, and then pan shots are moving left to right. A pan shot is a fixed, so the camera's not actually moving. It's just panning from left to right. And a truck is where the camera is actually moving. So these, these are more like, um, is the camera moving versus not moving? But they all imply action of some type. The tilt, again, the camera is fixed, but you're either moving it up or down and versus a pedestal where you're moving the camera up or down. So again, like you could easily move something up and down, right? You can easily tilt something back and forth. These aren't like complicated moves and no one's asking you to like skateboard across your kitchen and with a camera. So, you know, work on it, play with it. So you have fun. You know, there are lots of tutorials on how to move your camera. Um, I've seen one where this guy will flip his camera and I'll put it on a, uh, oh my gosh, a towel to get that like sliding out kind of dolly move. And he'll just pull the, he'll hold the camera and he'll pull the napkin or towel and the camera comes with it. So it's sort of like this zoom out action, which is super cool. So it's not hard. Uh, you just have to put some thought into it and decide you want to do it. And if you mess up, who cares? Don't include it then. It's fine. All right. So then it comes to finalizing that lighting, making sure you've got the light right. Because like I said, it's so important with everything. So, you know, once you've got your script, you're feeling good, double check that lighting, you know, like make sure that you got a great day. Maybe you got to go to the weather app and make sure you've got the perfect climate, the perfect light for your shooting. Okay. Uh, again, artificial light's cool. I love it. I use it all the time. I did not use it to make the video I'm about to show you in a bit. So it's, completely unnecessary. It's just, you know, when I found limitations, I was like, Ugh, I need to move on. And in order to move on, I needed to get some artificial light. Don't start there though, unless you already have it. Lastly, please make sure you have enough room on whatever device to store your content. The number of times I have filmed something and I've gotten the message that says you are out of storage. It are, it's the number is too many times. It's ridiculous and, and embarrassing. And I don't want that for you. So make sure you have some sort of storage device. Maybe it's a drive of some kind, an external hard drive. Have something backup you can use to store your files so you're not running into that sort of uh, inconvenience. Please do that for me. All right, now you need to practice. And I will say this to you because of who you are. Dietitians are perfectionists. And I mean that in a loving way. You guys are so good at being detail-oriented and getting it right. Uh, but I would say practice until it feels okay. Practice till it feels good. Don't over practice or you're gonna dislike the whole process. You're gonna wish you'd never done it. You know, I typically do one or one or two times dry run. I'm checking my light, I'm checking my sound focus gear, all that stuff. I'm checking all and I'm just, and then I'm done. Cause if I keep going, I'm gonna overthink it. It's gonna feel false and it's gonna present poorly. So I would encourage you to trust yourself. And just practice a little bit till you feel really, you know, you feel confident in what you're doing and then move on. And I mentioned these things in your check because they're the most important. If you're talking, you got to make sure that people can hear you. So if you are doing an interview, maybe you want some mics. Maybe the phone mic isn't going to cut it. You can get some like $50 external mics. You can probably get a used one too. You should always check the used sections of those stores, um, online stores too. They always have seconds of stuff or used products. So give those a try. Focus, oh my gosh. The number of times along with storage story, I have shot something that's out of focus. It's it's far too many. I should know better. But when you're in it, sometimes you're like, oh, this is fun. And then you're like, oh, no, I shot that and it wasn't in focus. Just make sure, especially if you're doing video and you're changing your angle, first thing you should check is the focus as well as the light. So make sure in focus. Nobody wants to watch an interview of you with you out of focus. That was that would be strange. Um, and then you have to film it all over again. Don't do that to yourself. If you've got other gear you're planning on using, practice with it. Make sure you know how to use it. Okay, now it comes time to film, right? You're excited. You're ready to go. You've got your script. Everything's ready. With who? Uh, just some final thoughts when it comes to filming. And, you know, just incorporate this into everything else you're doing. Framing 
which is, you know, the stuff that you want in the shot. Think about this when you think about your angles and where your stuff is going to land, right? So if I'm going to YouTube for my video content, that's a horizontal platform. But say I want to share my video in Instagram too. Well, most of that content is vertical. So if I'm smart and I want to put it in both places, I can either film it twice or I can set up my frame so that my wide frame captures what I need it to, but is wider, wide enough to capture the wide screen that fits on YouTube. But then I'm also creating my content in a narrow enough space that everything I need to use lands within that vertical space so I can post it on Instagram so that all I do is change the orientation and everything is still there. So tricky, but it can be done. So think about framing, depending on where you wanna use the stuff. You know, you don't have to shoot it twice to make it land in different spots. You just have to be smarter about how you're filming it up front, if that makes sense. All right, also make sure your hero is in focus. Focus is so important. Like how many videos have you watched from your childhood where your dad shot the video, your mom or someone shot video of you and it's out of focus and you're like, who is that, Gary? Is Gary doing that? Who knows? No one can tell because it's out of focus. Make sure your stuff is in focus, make it memorable or unless focus isn't your thing, then that's memorable too, I guess. You can also use the autofocus feature. So if it's just you, I don't like that for recipes, but I like it for face. So your camera will recognize your face. So if you're moving around, it'll keep the focus on your face. So if you're doing a lot of that kind of content, then use the camera autofocus uh, as a great tool for that. Final checks, of course, you're making sure your batteries are charged, your, everything's Everything's ready to go. Uh, you've got that backup storage if you need it. Everything's in focus. You actually hit the record button. Oh my. Yeah, check all the stuff like four times. You'll be glad you did. While you're shooting, you should also grab B-roll. It's that extra content that you can use later, whether it's in this video or another video down the road. So B-roll is like the video of me cracking eggs into a bowl. A video of you know me whisking the eggs or just the bowl of eggs being whisked or it's just the ingredient shot or it's you picking flowers in the meadow i don't it's whatever it's the extra stuff that you know you can plop in later and you can use it as filler content or to break up stuff you're doing it's just magical so whenever you can grab that b-roll you grab that b-roll so that you can put it in there as supplemental footage uh and then in terms of filming it I always recommend breaking it into chunks. So in your script, if it's helpful for you, you can designate this by saying, you know, I'm gonna film up to this point because this is a point where I might need to change my camera angle. It's kind of a natural stopping point. And then I'll stop there, I'll change my camera angle, grab a glass of water. I'll beat my head against the wall a few times. I'll turn to my favorite music, jam out for a minute, and then I'll go back in. So breaking it into chunks makes it a lot more easy for you to digest and do sometimes, especially if your video is maybe longer or you feel like you have a lot of content you have to share. Don't do it all the way through. I don't think I've ever done it all the way through. It'll just make you crazy. And that's not the point. We're not trying to make you crazy. Okay. Lastly, uh, consider your clothing. Uh, if you're doing a lot of face, hands, not hands, face to the video, and you're showing yourself, it's really important that you wear bright colors, things that complement your skin tones and aren't super distracting. So, you know, bunches of platterns and platterns, patterns, and, you know, save your palm tree shirt for something else. That's not the time. So keep it solid colors. Usually, you know, if your background is, is white, don't wear a white shirt, just those kinds of things, just to make sure that you don't, you know, fade into your background. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to show you a little bit of my space and what I'm working with uh, when I'm filming. And this is my kitchen and you'll never see my kitchen counter, actual kitchen counter in any of my videos because I don't like it. Uh, so I buy these little vinyl backdrops. You'll see it again soon, see, see it there? And I lay that down and I use that as my mm, counter. And you'll see my setup here too. That is a C stand on a, the silver thing you'll see in a second is a C stand and attached to that is an articulating arm. And then attached to that is a clamp for my phone. Now this setup works for me. I, it took me lots of trial and error and lots of other things to get to this point. I tried a stand on the countertop. I've tried um, an overhead rig thing. I, I've tried them all and I liked this the best. So it was an investment, but it's part of my business. So for me, it just felt natural and I felt fine. And I love the flexibility of this articulating arm. It makes it so that I can easily 
can move a shot, you can see like I'm capable of just turning my camera really quickly to get a different angle for my shot. So for me, it works. You know, some people like the stands on the countertop. I like to use every single inch of my countertop. So that just wasn't going to work for me. So that's why I just kind of went with the C stand, which is actually a great stand too. So if you are looking for a stand, that's a really good basic one to have on hand. But you'll see, I'm trying to capture all the different shots using all the different things. So my husband took a lot of these shots of me. Obviously, I didn't take them of myself. But you can also grab your kid or your spouse or whoever's around and ask them, your neighbor, to do a little bit of this extra shot footage of you too. If, if you're like, I don't want to set up a second camera. He was only filming me for maybe 10 minutes. That's all it took. Okay. So editing. This could be a whole separate topic. So I'm just going to touch on a few things, a few tips and some recommendations. And then uh, if you have questions, let me know. Happy to discuss it. But editing is a huge part of filming. So you may think like, oh, I filmed it. I'm done. I can just send that off. And you can. Again, I think you should be spontaneous. Sometimes I think you should just record and hit upload and, and go for it. I think that's totally fine. And it's beautiful, actually. Uh, but if you want to do something more polished, you want to, you know, present this in a way that makes you look like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, then editing can really help you a whole lot. So I took like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of actual footage and consolidated it two seconds worth for the reel. I'm going to show you at the end. Now, that took a lot of time. Editing isn't just like plopping it in and you're done. You've got to think about, okay, what is engaging to the viewer? Is this too much of this content? Or would it be helpful to show this other shot? You know, what's more important here to telling the story? And in terms of tips, that leads me to how do you introduce this video? So you should always lead with some sort of dynamic part to your video, whether that's you asking a question, you're like, did you know that Sarah was born on the 26th of January? Not the most, okay, that's not super dynamic, but you know what I mean? Lead with some sort of engaging question where people are like, oh, I don't know. Will you please tell me? Always interesting. You know, if you're doing a, a recipe, that's also super easy. You know, maybe it's you ladling soup into the bowl or pouring, you know, pulling the, the cheese off your, you know, the cheese pole from the pizza slice. So anything that's like dynamic and interesting and has movement or just you being super engaging is a great way to lead. Then you can think about, uh, you know, most editing is just clipping the pieces together, right? And then thinking about transitions. Some people don't want to transition. They just, like for me, I don't add transitions. It's just another step where I'm like, Bleh. so I just piece myself together. One thing right after the other. But you may like the way it feels to transition or there may be instances where that feels nicer and you need to transition a little more smoothly. And then you can add transitions, but there are other things you can do like this cut to action. Like I was talking about before, it's sort of similar to like a Zoom. And you can do this in editing versus in actual production where you can go from a wide shot and then narrow that shot down. And you can do that in editing. You don't have to rely on you know your camera to do that for you. So that's the nice thing about editing. Editing will also allow you to, you know, if your scene was dark, you can lighten it. If it needs a little more contrast, let you do all things, adjust the sound, adjust everything. Timing, you can speed things up, slow things down. It's fantastic. That's why editing is beautiful. So I would definitely encourage you to learn an editing app. Uh, I primarily use Adobe Rush, but I've listed some other ones here. Really, they're all kind of the same. They do the same stuff. You know, some people like one versus the other, but I learned Adobe Rush. And so now I'm just, that's my go-to. I don't really want to learn another platform unless someone convinces me otherwise. But they all do the same thing, the drag and drop, and then you can adjust the time and you can, you know, you can do the same stuff. So just find one you like, maybe try out a couple to begin with and see which one's more user-friendly for you. And then just keep practicing. It's going to be annoying. You're probably not going to love it right away, or maybe you will, but it's just learning a new thing and you'll get, you'll get the hang of it and you'll figure it out and it'll all be good. And then finally, I want to talk about voiceover. So sometimes you might need to do a voiceover, but recording a voiceover can sound weird in big rooms with lots of space or in rooms with lots of people, or, you know, there, it, the ideal situation isn't usually ideal for recording your voice. So I'll give you this tip. I do almost all of my voiceovers in my closet. I do. You know how people go into those rooms in the music videos and they have the headphones and they're all padded and they're like, doo-doo-doo. Uh, those rooms are insulated so that the sound sounds amazing. Your closet is kind of like that. I mean, it's not as stylish and as hip for sure, or maybe it is. 
asking for you, but it works great. I have all the insulation I need, close the door. No one bothers me. It's perfect. It works every single time. So you heard that tip from me. All right. Oops. Hold on before we get there right now. Okay. So that, that's it. That's the thing. That's all the stuff. All right. So I wanted to show you after putting all the stuff together, the video is the final thing. So we're going to watch the video and you can see what all it's put together. Did you know that according to the American Heart Association, healthy people can enjoy an average of seven eggs per week on a heart healthy diet? Super exciting news, right? That's why I love incorporating them into all kinds of dishes, especially quick fix ones like these veggie loaded muffin cups. They are a make ahead meal that you can enjoy every day for breakfast. So let me show you how to make them. Making these muffin cups is easy. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, then prepare a muffin pan by spraying with nonstick cooking spray. Chop some spinach, some roasted red peppers, and some green onion and toss it together in a bowl. Divide that mixture among your muffin cups, then top with crumbled feta cheese. Add eggs to a bowl along with milk, Italian seasoning, pepper, and salt, and whisk until combined. Pour that mixture among the cups and then stick it in the oven for about 22 minutes. Let it cool in the pan before you transfer it to a wire rack to finish cooling. I love adding veggies to these egg bites because eggs pair so well with vegetables, which most Americans don't eat enough of, so it's a great way to get them in there. I love these muffin cups for breakfast, but they're also really delicious for lunch and dinner. And I'm not gonna lie, I've definitely eaten them as a snack. Find more great recipes just like these on my website. All right, so there's the video. I shot it all on my iPhone. I did a voiceover in my closet. So anything is possible. And I wanted to share the video one more time. And this time I want you to look for all the different things you've already learned about. Look at the different angles, look about all the camera actions and how the editing was done. And just try to notice the things that maybe you wouldn't have noticed before. All right, here you go. Did you know that according to the American Heart Association, healthy people can enjoy an average of seven eggs per week on a heart healthy diet? Super exciting news, right? That's why I love incorporating them into all kinds of dishes, especially quick fix ones like these veggie loaded muffin cups. They are a make ahead meal that you can enjoy every day for breakfast. So let me show you how to make them. Making these muffin cups is easy. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, then prepare a muffin pan by spraying with nonstick cooking spray. Chop some spinach, some roasted red peppers, and some green onion and toss it together in a bowl. Divide that mixture among your muffin cups, then top with crumbled feta cheese. Add eggs to a bowl along with milk, Italian seasoning, pepper, and salt, and whisk until combined. Pour that mixture among the cups and then stick it in the oven for about 22 minutes. Let it cool in the pan before you transfer it to a wire rack to finish cooling. I love adding veggies to these egg bites because eggs pair so well with vegetables, which most Americans don't eat enough of, so it's a great way to get them in there. I love these muffin cups for breakfast, but they're also really delicious for lunch and dinner. And I'm not gonna lie, I've definitely eaten them as a snack. Find more great recipes just like these on my website. All right, hopefully you were able to see all the different shots and you were able to identify all the things that you maybe wouldn't have noticed before, which was the goal of the whole presentation. So I wanted to take just the last few minutes here to just let you know that you're not alone, that there are a lot of people who worry and concerned, like, should I make a video? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where to start. And it's okay to be afraid, but the worst thing is just to never try it, right? So get yourself out there, Put yourself out there, feel good about what you're gonna do. Lean on people who know stuff and can help you because this is how I got to where I am too. I definitely would never get to where I was if I hadn't asked and questions and leaned into the people who I knew could support me. So use this as inspiration to get out there and just make a video. I think you can do it. I know you can do it. And if anything, you may absolutely contact me this is my website and you can Instagram is a great way to get a hold of me. You can send me a message and I'm happy to answer. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a fabulous time and I hope you've learned something along the way as well.